Hi, everyone. This is Jason Breck of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today, John Manfreda and I of Wall Street for Main Street are joined by the silver guru himself, David Morgan, and his senior analyst at the Morgan Report, and also a great investor and hedge fund manager, Chris Marchese, another friend of the show. Uh, and they're here to talk about not just the silver market, but also one of their crowning achievements. They've released a new book called The Silver Manifesto. So uh, thank you for joining us here today, Chris Marchese and David Morgan. Thank you. Um, just a slight correction there. Uh, David Smith's actually our senior analyst. But outside of that, you've got it all perfect. Yeah, my pleasure to be back. All right. First question I wanted to get into was uh, you guys have the Silver Summit coming up this uh, week. Uh, one is how does the attendance look like compared to past Silver Summits? And uh, what would people uh, that are going, what can they expect this year? Well, I'll speak to the um, attendance level. From the 2012 show, we lost 20, about 25 uh, companies. And from the 2013 show, we lost about 25 more. So we're probably down roughly 50, um, 50 companies or vendors and not always company mining companies. Sometimes they're, you know, bullion dealers or futures brokers or, you know, there's different people that attend the, the uh, summit that display so that's off uh it's probably going to be about the same as last year as far as the amount of attendance obviously the amount of booze is down but i think the actual attendance is going to be um pretty similar to what it was last year i'll let chris address what to expect this year and i can add on to that yeah i expect it to be similar or maybe even higher than last year just because it's the true believers that are still in the market and as opposed to last year, you know, silver's a little cheaper, so that might might draw extra, you know, additional value investors to the summit. Yeah, what what we've seen, guys, like, and you guys can comment on this too, uh, Chris and David. Uh, we've seen a, a bunch of gold and silver and other resource uh, conferences canceled. I believe the New York Card Asset Conference was canceled, the San Francisco one was canceled, and even the Cambridge House one, which is a you know resource conference, that thing was rebranded, right? It wasn't even called a resource conference anymore. So these are classic, you know, contrarian indicator signs, right, that, that were close to a bottom, is it not? Absolutely. I think that um, we are very close to the bottom, if not at the bottom, or maybe even perhaps uh, up from the bottom. But uh, it's too early to look at the data and say, absolutely, we need to see more volume and we have to see more price action to the upside before we can absolutely know it's a bottom. Hmm. I was wondering, do you all think uh, every time I hear uh, one of a former, I guess, uh, not former, but a fellow, another guest, he always talks about capitulation. It's Rick Rule and how... Uh, about a, how important it is to a bottom. Do you think a capitulation uh, phase is needed to put in a final bottom, or can it, a bottom actually occur without capitulation? Well, first of all, Rick and I are about the same age, and because of that fact, I think uh, you know we have some market savvy based on experience that you really can't get any other way. I would agree that capitulation is probably required and I would say in a lot of cases, we have uh, seen it. Uh, some of um, the people that have been pretty loyal subscribers to the Morgan Report, one uh, gentleman in particular, I'll keep his anonymity, but he sold a great deal of his silver, physical silver holdings uh, very recently. Uh, not to the bottom to the day or the bottom so far anyhow, but very close. I mean, under 18. And uh, he had purchased uh, below 10, but nonetheless, uh, you know, he wrote it all the way from 10 up to 48 to, you know, watch it go to 30, 35 to 30 to, you know, break the 26 level down to holding 20 for almost a year and then break through 20 down into the level we're at now. So that is capitulation. And of course, one data point, one individual doesn't make a market, obviously. But I think as far as, you know, concrete examples, do I have any of the answers? Yes, and he's not the only one. So I think we've seen it in the shares. Uh, and I think we've seen it, uh, you know, in the physical market and the ETFs. The, the hedge fund managers capitulated a long time ago. So as far as I'm concerned, do you need it? The answer is yes. Has it occurred? The answer would be yes. Or, or it's 
occurred or occurring. I don't, I'm not, it's not something that we have to wait and see happen in a future point. It's either behind us or nearly behind us, the way I see the work. David, I agree with you, but would you agree that capitulation is usually marked by volatility levels dropping like a rock for a while? In my experience, uh, they, it usually dies down before a move up or down. Exactly, and you're right. We're still seeing some volatility, and uh, you know the old adage: never sell a quiet market. When everybody's kind of standing on the sidelines and not pulling the trigger on anything, not shorting, not going long, sitting there and watching, and you have extremely low volatility, that very quiet market. The adage again is never sell a quiet market. Uh, so I agree with you, Chris, and we haven't really seen that yet, but I think it's just ahead of us. Yeah, it's uh, mentally uncomfortable, guys, to uh, to buy – and this is why most professionals don't even do it – to buy something that's down 40 50% or even more than that in the cases for some gold or silver companies, even even the quality producer uh, gold and silver miners, and uh, keep accumulating metal. So I think the goal with part of the manipulation that's gone on in the paper markets has been to you know control sentiment, paint the charts, and just destroy you know the uh, – the, the support levels. And, you know, when you do that, you have like what happens, David, you were around during the, the 1974 to 1976 cyclical bear market before the gold and silver prices exploded higher again. It seems to be we're kind of repeating history again with that type of thing where I think gold went from, what, 35 to 200, and then the chart broke, right? And it went to 100 or lower for a little while, and almost everyone sold. And then it rocketed, you know, eightfold higher before the gold bull market back then ended and Paul Volcker did the right thing. And I must add, I mean, that's, you know, are we going to see this same exact thing? No. Are we going to see something similar? Yes, I think so. And, you know, I've been uh, talking about what lies ahead, that the big money lies ahead, the easy money has already come off the table. And I truly believe that if you study markets, there's an acceleration phase, and we haven't seen that in this market yet. Hmm. Okay, well, um, I, I have a question, John. Um, bef before we go more in depth about gold and silver, uh, I want to ask you guys about Austrian School of Economics because your new book, The Silver Manifesto, it covers a lot about Austrian School of Economics. It goes pretty much in depth. Chris, you, you've been telling me about that. Um, we, we have the Keynesians still in power now. You know, they. They, they kind of realize the system is on its last legs. They want to switch to either the SDR or another unbacked fiat currency and start inflating again and creating more asset bubbles. Uh, why is Keynesian economics still running the show here for the economic and political elites um, in government and on, and on Wall Street? Well, it benefits them the most uh, at the expense of uh, society at large. So they want to keep that going. And I don't think they'll be able to simply because I think the East, um, you know, they'll start backing their currency with gold. You know, this might include China, Russia, uh, possibly India and Germany. And I think that'll put a stop to that as um, prices, true market prices will be reflected as the physical market determine, you know, is, you know, basically price discovery, whereas, uh, you know, the COMEX isn't. It's just a paper market. Yeah, David, and you had a great analogy about the COMEX being a paper market. I heard it on the roundtable uh, the, the other day uh, with Andy Hoffman and the other guests. I think that's a brilliant analogy for the silver market where it's basically, you know, drop shipping. They claim to have all this inventory of physical precious metals, and yet basically, you know, they have like one car in the showroom, and you got to wait – a number of months to get your order if it's large. It's just it's just kind of ridiculous that you know they they say that they have these types of inventories and then they're not there and then you know they they're changing the rules on the exchange to benefit themselves. Yeah, that's a pretty fair characterization. I might um, comment slightly on it, but yeah, the analogy I'll stand by it. It's like a showroom. There's your car. Uh, put in your order. We are limiting production. The production that we're limiting is 7.5 million ounces. That's the limit. So you could hold contracts for, uh, you know, three, four, five times that amount, pay for them. Well, tough. You're only going to get 7.5 million ounces per our contract. And that's, you know, not changing the rules, 
that's the rules in place. And uh, I put that right straight from the CME website in the Morgan Report last month. So there's absolutely no argument. If we're going to argue with anybody, they're going to argue with the CME contract, which is one of my pet peeves, Jason, and that is like a lot of stuff in our lives. I mean, I'm guilty of it too. You know, when I get these agreements, when they up, grade my cell phone to a new uh, software status, I agree. I don't read that stuff. I can't even see it on the phone, to be honest with you. So I hit agree. Well, on the futures market, it's very similar from the aspect there's all this fine print, and you've got to agree to the terms and conditions, and the conditions and terms in the silver market, and they're for all markets. I mean, if you open up a general account, you're going to be trading potentially any commodity, but back on point, specifically in silver, you agree that the limit that can be taken in the physical form is 1,500 contracts, which is roughly 7.5 million ounces. So anyone that stands up and jumps up and down and says, well, I'm standing up for delivery, I'm going to take, you know, 25 million ounces off the exchange or 50 million ounces off the exchange, good luck, because you've already signed a contract saying that you know the limit is 7.5. So again, the analogy, I think, is fairly accurate. It's like, yeah, stand in line. Here's our production rate. Here's what we say we have, which they may have. But it doesn't matter from the bottom line because it's a flow rate. It's not a quantity. It's just like a mining project. They might have X amount in the ground. That's something to focus on. But too many people focus on that. What you really have to know is what comes up out of the ground on a per month or an annual basis. How much are you flowing in the market? And for all practical purposes, the COMEX flows practically nothing into the market. Yeah, I definitely uh... – I was actually wondering one thing is speaking of the COMEX and the futures trading, uh, Ch- Shanghai has just opened up their futures market uh, this year. Inventories are looking like uh, they're tight. Uh, China has, I've read stories recently about China's declining production. Uh, do you think uh, there's a possible way that in the next couple of years, China's going to start controlling uh, or at least have greater influence on pricing over the COMEX? Chris, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, one? sure. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, that will be the price discovery mechanism. The interesting thing about the Shanghai exchanges and some other futures exchanges in uh, China specifically is that the government no longer buys um, from the exchange. They import it to, I think it's five different cities. So now this is just private buying. We don't really get to see um, – what the government is doing. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't think the government wants anyone to know what they're doing until they have a certain amount. And I think officially the largest. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, um, they wouldn't, if they're still buying and plan on buying more, why would they want to um, announce whatever they have? Because that's, uh, that will assuredly drive the price higher uh, based on a lot of the numbers I've been seeing. So, uh, yeah, it wouldn't make any sense for them to announce it, and they shouldn't ever. Yeah, and I think Jim Rickards confirms that in his new book, The Death of Money. He talks about how he personally knows through his contacts that the Chinese military smuggled in 500 tons of gold last year uh, through different channels. You know, the Chinese military basically trucked the gold or tanked the gold or convoyed the gold across the mainland Chinese border in different routes, not through, you know, either Hong Kong or the Shanghai Gold Exchange or the normal conventional ways that gold would get into the country. Okay. So I think it's it's confirming what you guys said. Now, in, in terms of the, uh, the demand part of the market here for silver, um, you know, we've seen the silver price come down a lot, but um, has there been any kind of reduction in um, industrial demand for silver globally? The uh, industrial demand really has been flat for quite some time, and it's healthy. I mean, the demand, again, I've said this too many times probably, but demand 10 years ago was about 35% of the market. Now it's over half of the market. And during the last decade, the production of silver out of the ground has increased at about 3% rate year over year over year. So we certainly are mining more than we ever have. And even though we're mining more, the consumption by industry uh, continued to increase to the level that we're at right now, which has, again, been steady for a while. I think a lot depends on what happens in the world global economy going forward. 
Silver is kind of a good time, bad time metal. When it's good times, it acts like an industrial metal, more like a base metal. And you can look at uh, silver going up with the stock market somewhat. Uh, gold's much more negatively correlated than silver, although the, you know, the correlation between gold and silver is very strong, 85%. Nonetheless, <clears throat> silver is different than gold, so it has that aspect. And then when times are bad, silver acts more like gold as a safe haven metal. So it's a pretty tough call right here. Chris and I actually discussed this this morning, so I'll let him add on to it. He's got some pretty good thinking on the topic. It's pretty. It's a pretty tough call right now. I think David summed it up, uh, you know, pretty well in that it depends a lot on the world economy and what that does. Um, you know, a lot of it's they're pretty price inelastic. So uh, if the world economy comes uh, contracts pretty uh, violently, which I don't see any way around that not happening, uh, the impacts will be felt uh, nearly as much in the in, on the industrial side as in relative to what you'll see in the drop in base metals, precisely because silver has what, you know, I think we both, I don't want to talk for David, but what we both think will drive silver prices much higher, and that's the investment um, demand. We were actually on both on a panel uh, discussing um, this specific question at the Silver Summit. Yeah, I definitely see a lot of, uh, if you look at some of the numbers, Perth Mint sales are very high. The Eagles are very high. Uh, Maple Leafs have gotten a lot of growth, as Chris pointed out to me a while back, a lot of uh, – Canadian maple is their highest growth. Uh, I was wondering, in your book, you did write about uh, industrial demand. Uh, is there any catalyst do you see in the future for industrial demand, Chris? Again, it has to do with the economy. Um, because if, a co you know, say a China is just doing well, you know, there's a lot of technologies that, you know, need to be uh, – more studied, you know, so they become economic, that will drive, uh, you know, that part of the market. And personally, I think industrial demand will probably flat to slightly up, you know, at least until the end of the decade. And basically through whatever currency crises around the world will happen, you know, we'll have to overcome that to see industrial demand really start to pick up again in my you know from my personal point of view and um we're, we're starting to see uh david and chris we're starting to see um the manufacturers become more efficient with using silver right we're starting to see more nano sprays on silver where silver is used in smaller amounts in uh woven into clothing or silver is put in water, water filtration systems or david you've also talked about silver now being sprayed onto plastics so it preserves food longer um are, are we going to see continue to see that where people still want to use silver in the manufacturing process but they're going to use less and less of it um per like individual unit so like where um they put it on a computer and they spray it or something like that instead of you know a massive amount of silver in each computer Yes, and that's, you know, typical of uh, the real economy. I mean, anytime you produce something, you're always looking for ways to increase your margin or increase your profit, especially when there's a, an ongoing inflation that's rarely talked about in real terms. This, you know, government number is preposterous, and almost everybody is aware of that. But even without it, you're looking for a way to make your product better, and less costly. So taking solar panels, which is probably the best uh, example, is that the projection from Jessica Cross uh, several years ago was that by 2015, you'd be using about 130 million ounces of silver per year on an annual basis for photovoltaics or solar panels. We were right on her projection for about three years in a row. And then the last two, it, it dropped off. What's interesting is the analysis behind that, because the amount of solar panels that she forecast was probably right on. So her accuracy as far as the amount of solar panels was correct, but what wasn't factored into her thinking, and no one could know at the time, was the amount of silver per panel used. That's been squeezed down. But if you think it through all the way, 
what it means is it costs less to the consumer and the producer for a solar panel. So as that gets squeezed, it's more efficient for the consumer to perhaps consider buying solar rather than, let's say, mainstream energy, which would be uh, electricity from, let's say, nuclear, hydropower, coal, or something like that. So it could have a rebound effect where, you know, I could pit this much money into solar panels and power my house and never have to talk to a utility company for the next 15 years. And I think that's a good uh, economically sound decision. So we could get a rebound there. And that could apply in other areas as well, Jason. So it's something that, you know, the average person may just, you know, look at the trend and think, well, that trend is it. You know, it's peaked. It's not going anywhere. But if you really think it through from an economic basis, you can see what, where I'm coming from, hopefully. Hopefully. I explained that well. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and when silver became so cheap, David, like earlier in the years when Warren Buffett was accumulating it, right? Because it was way below production costs back then too in the early '90s. When you started uh, investing massively again in silver, uh, they started because it was so cheap. Scientists started testing it and researching it, right, and coming up with new ways to develop it uh, and use it in the indus- in- industrial process for different things. Absolutely, and I jokingly say that you know, so that uh, Warren Buffett was the best silver miner that ever existed. I mean, 129.7 million ounces of fine silver. Uh, you know, that's 20. That's a 20 million ounce mine for you know six years plus. And all he had was a slight storage problem and maybe a slight transportation problem. He didn't have any EPA problems, labor problems, disputes over the mine land, who's patented, who isn't, and all that stuff that goes into building a mine. So he bought it under the cost of production, bought it all at once, and it was, you know, it's quite a story, and I have, you know, more than I can say right now on the whole big, big story, but uh, the point being, you know, that's the way to do it. Buy it when you could get it for less than a producer could produce it for, and hold on to it. This is a slight tangent. David, you might also want to chime in on this. I think Warren Buffett sold that silver. I still think he has it somewhere. What do you guys? Oh, yeah. Well, so I heard I, Chris. It gets into like the the big conspiracy thing, and I don't like to put the tin foil hat on. Believe me, but what we do know for a fact is that he shipped it to London. That's been verified by such notables as Jeffrey Christian and of course Buffett himself. And we also know that almost the exact amount that he had, 130 million ounces, was the exact amount that he started the SLV with. So is that a coincidence or not? A question. Hmm, sure smells interestingly. And then if you go a step beyond that, you say, well, if you read the prospectus, it never really states who the owners are. They talk about who the holders are. And and if you're illegal, you're saying, well, holding something doesn't necessarily mean that you're the owner of it. I mean, if I hold your car keys and drive off with it because we have a verbal agreement that I can use your car for a week and I give them back, who owned the car? Well, you own the car the whole time. I'm just holding it for a while. So I don't want to get too far down that rabbit trail, but I want to voice what I did so people can think about it. Yeah, I, I had heard rumors, too, similar to what you guys had heard, that uh – Warren Buffett was ordered to get rid of the silver and that they just moved it into the SLV. But I mean, um, that's just from hearing different other people's stories. So uh, all I know is like basically what David just said, the evidence that Warren Buffett had a certain size position and that, and then around that certain size position ended up being the beginnings of the SLV. So other than that, you know, I don't know anything I can add. Well, I'm going more on the basis of his investing methodology. It's not buy and sell. Warren Buffett's buy and hold. Yeah, well, Buffett, all he has to do is list it as miscellaneous miscellaneous on his balance sheet. (laughs) It's so much. So uh, I personally think just with his background, meaning his father and who taught him, I I have a hard time believing Buffett just got rid of it, you know. Maybe he was ordered to get rid of it, though. That's the thing. Maybe he was ordered to get rid of it Uh, with uh, um, threats or penalties like the Hunt brothers. Um, with with um, talking with Eric Sprott, like and some of his people, I mean, that's pro- one of the reasons why he hasn't, you know, blown up the SLV yet. Besides the position limits, is you know, if he started creating other LLCs and accumulating physical silver all over the globe, it would, you know, put a big target on his back, like the Hunt Brothers. Uh, what what happened to the Hunt Brothers if he started buying too much silver too quickly? Well, 
I think old Warren Buffett has some good lobbying power. So <laughs> I, I don't know if uh, that would be too so easy to do. But in speaking of uh, tinfoil hats and conspiracy, we'll go to their favorite subject now, the, the Fed. Uh, right now, it's the Fed has talked about QE4. Uh, you know, James Bullard said it's not off the table. They're expected to end QE this month. Uh, if the Fed actually ended QE, uh, I guess I'll direct this at uh, Chris. Uh, what do you think would happen to the markets? Do you think there'd be any real change, or would it be a gradual change? Uh, I think the markets would correct rather significantly, but that's only under the assumption that the market bought into what the Fed is selling. And they're they're doing a pretty bad job of selling the fact that they're going to raise rates, what, what are they saying? I think mid-2015. Because, I mean, if you think about it, even if they hike the Fed funds rate to 1.5%, which is nothing on a historical basis and, you know, negative in real terms, that would send the economy into a tailspin. Hmm. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, the Fed has done those reverse repos, too. They, they tried to prevent some massive bubbles or at least slow things down. But, you know, it's like what they said. They're kind of tapering into a recession. And we have these currency wars here, you know, in Japan and Europe where Europe, their currency was too strong, and they're all Keynesians too, so they want to weaken their currency to, to increase export and, and things like this. It's just all ridiculous, guys, just seeing this play out. Yeah, I personally think the Fed will eventually have to reverse course. I think the, the illusion of uh, prosperity cannot happen without uh, money printing and uh, expansion of credit. Uh, now, I have a question. When you think uh, the Fed reverses course, uh, you think uh, Wall Street will be like uh, QE3? Uh, any of you can take this where the stock market just went in a boom, or do you think it would be more like QE2 or 1 where the stock market was afloat and metals just started going through the route? What do you all think would happen? I think it will be something none of us could think about, but uh, I'll – after saying that, venture out. I think you could see something happen to the bond market. I mean, the people that are the big players, let's call them, you know, your Bill Gross, which is, has left PIMCO. I mean, when you're in the bond market, you're in the big boy leagues. I mean, this is massive amounts of capital that are changing hands. And they're probably the smartest guys out there. I mean, when I started trading commodities in my 20s, you know, the one thing that everyone was kind of in awe of were the bond traders. And the point is that when or if the Fed goes one more round, somebody that really understands how these markets work, and of course that's way beyond this group, might just say enough is enough, I'm getting out. I mean, Bill Gross might be that canary in the coal mine that's like, wow, why did he leave? Anyway, the point could be that it'd be something way beyond QE1, 2, or 3, that something happens in the debt markets that even the Fed doesn't expect to happen, and all of a sudden, you can't get it back. You know, it's the falling off the cliff kind of thing, and uh, there's no way out. It's going down. So that's my two cents. I don't know, but I do know that that scenario or something close to that always has taken place in the past. And this time it's a global phenomenon. It's not just one nation state that's going down. It's going to be pretty much taking the whole system. Not to say that the BRICS might be uh, insulated somewhat. It depends how fast they, you know, band together, which they're doing, how much uh, trade to trade they do with each other, which they're doing, how their uh, SWIFT program uh, works, uh, what their credit backing is, et cetera. But nonetheless, for all practical purposes, uh, we're all tied together, at least for the time being. And um, and Dave, David and Chris, what, what's your opinion of Rob, Rob Kirby's, Kirby's work where he says that interest rates will never be allowed to rise again? Uh, yeah, they will rise. It won't because the the Fed makes them uh, go up. It's because the market ends up controlling the entire yield curve. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I personally think that you can only manipulate rates so low for so long. Uh, and not only that, just the manipulation of interest rates just gives it just gives wrong signals to entrepreneurs on when to invest and the uh, consumption and investment curve that it's just caused a, a great disaster, uh, in my opinion. I just don't see. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that, John. I think it's misallocated trillions of dollars of capital, whether it's in the U.S. or Japan or Europe. And, I mean, Japan's been trying to manipulate their interest rates lower pretty much lo uh, longer than anyone else. So Japan may run out of runway longer, uh, sooner than even the U.S. does. We're, we're going to find that out uh, very soon, I think, in the next couple of years. Um, I, I want to transition here to another question here. We covered uh, silver demand, the industrial and the investment side, but we didn't talk about supply yet, and that's something the Morgan Report specializes in with the miners and production. Um, David, you and Chris put out a great study about production costs for the miners, all in production costs, including a whole bunch of different inputs. I think you guys said it's 22 to $23 an ounce all in for primary silver miners. Um, have they been able to cut costs even lower than that? And um, What's their balance sheets look like at this stage? Well, that's a part of that, the easy part. Yes, they have, as a whole, been able to reduce costs somewhat, but um, they're uh, not – I don't think they're able to reduce much more than they already have. So uh, I think the levels that they're at now is probably as good as it's going to get because you've got you know, low oil prices – uh, labor is not jumping up and down demanding higher wages because you've got, you know, quote unquote, official low inflation and on the other factors that go into that dynamic. But um, I'll defer to Chris on the balance sheet side. I know, although some look, you know, pretty healthy and others don't, but I'll let him get a little more specific. Yeah, the balance sheet, uh, you got to go to the, you know, the the best producers out there to find a solid balance sheet. There's a lot of debt that um, smaller producers uh, are going to have trouble paying back. Although, you know, in a lot of cases, I think silver prices will be high enough, you know, in a timely, uh, timely manner in order to avoid any major defaults. Uh, the big boys like gold corp and so on, uh, they have a lot of capital and not much debt. So their balance sheets are all right, but, you know, they're not getting any better really uh, just because of how in capital intensive the mining industry is. And now, you know, we have a lot of primary silver producers in Mexico and the new mining royalty tax, which, you know, is not just that. It's uh, the environmental duty and, you know, a whole bunch of other things that, go on to that. Uh, that's caused um, the inability for a lot of companies to generate free cash flow and uh, invest in new projects or invest in uh, further exploration. So, uh, you know, you got to stick with uh, companies with solid balance sheets and ones that, you know, have low uh, all in sustaining costs. Yeah, because John and I have looked at this, too, like separately. We read your work. But, um, I mean, it basically looks to us like a lot of these miners, um, the ones that are not the lowest cost, they can't really cut any more costs. You know, they've cut their, co their cost of capital sky high for debt and equity if they can get any. Uh, their exploration budgets are slashed, like, near zero or zero. Uh, they, they've high-graded the mine. Uh, you know, they, they haven't hedged their oil production costs necessarily. Maybe they haven't um, – they should be taking advantage of these cheap oil prices and locking in, you know, hedged uh, oil contracts or diesel. But um, it seems to me that, that uh, they, can, they can't really cut costs anymore without either shutting down the mine and putting it on care and maintenance or going bankrupt. Is, is that what you see and you think we're going to start to see some, um, some of that? Or, or are some of these miners going to figure out a way to get around this uh, for another six months or 12 months? Well, Jason, that's a great question. It's got to look individual, case by case basis. Um, you know, having being the gray hair of the group, a lot of times you can go to minimum mining, 
high grade if you have such a mine that you can high grade. An open pit, you really can't. But there could be an open pit with some high grade somewhere. I don't know. I'd, you got to look at a case by case basis. A lot of these mines will keep losing money on a quarterly basis for longer than you might expect, because in the long run, meaning like a year or more, and we'll just put it at a year, you're actually better off. Sounds stupid, but it costs so much if you go uh, and close the mine. A lot of times there's penalties with the contract you have with the uh, the area, the jurisdiction that you're in, that you got to give a lot of severance. You've got to pay um, the government authorities for your lease anyway, even if you stop mining. And so there's a lot of costs that continue even if you close down. So it's a financial decision to continue to lose as little money as possible and keep it functioning than to close it down. If you close it down, then a mine usually is extremely costly to bring back up because if it's an underground mine, you got the water problem, you got to pump it out. I mean, there's a lot of factors. So all I'm trying to say, and I'm trying to be succinct now, is you got to look at it on a case by case basis. And sometimes they'll continue to lose money, even though it doesn't make sense for them. It does on a longer term perspective. Yeah, I actually had Adrian Day on a month or so ago, and he actually said that once they shut down, they're not going to restart. So they'd have to lose confidence in the market. Uh, Per se. Uh, speaking of the miners in trouble, uh, Chris has talked about this frequently. Uh, the Mexican uh, new Mexican mining tax. And uh, Chris, would you be willing to? It seems like a, uh, you were talking about a lot of people don't understand it per se. Would you be willing to talk about uh, talk about what it is and just if it's had any real effect on Mexican mining so far? Uh, sure. Uh- um, I mean, there's a lot of things I can't include just because there's so many uh, extras put in the bill. But anyway, uh, so President Nieto snuck this into a larger bill, so it was going to get passed definitely. And this is a seven. So for precious metals companies, it's a half a percent tax on revenue. Well, I mean, uh, sorry, gro- I guess you would call it gross revenue. That is after. Uh, refining and transport costs. And then you have a 7.5% tax on, on EBITDA, so earnings before interest, uh, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And then uh, also the statutory rate in Mexico was initially supposed to drop to um, or stay at 28%. It will be. It has moved up to 29% as of the start of 2014, and now will then will increase to 30% in 2015. So these might sound like, uh, you know, kind kind of insignificant, uh, you know, t- taxes on them. But when you're operating at at these uh, metal prices, the operating cash flow margins are razor thin if a company even has them. So this has hurt um, a lot of mining companies. Even Gold Corp has come out and said, you know, we're going to spend X amount of uh, exploration dollars elsewhere over the next 10 years that were planned for Mexico. I forgot what the amount was. Yeah, I think that what got these miners in trouble, uh, David and Chris, is that these miners kept reporting these cash costs, which were not the real costs, and the governments would look at the PowerPoint presentations and go to mining conferences, right, and see these companies report, you know, back a couple years ago, there was, there, gold was at 18 or 1900 and miners would say, oh, our cash cost is $500 an ounce or $600 an ounce, and silver miners, when silver was at, you know, 45 or $50 an ounce uh, at the high in 2011, they would report, oh, our cash costs are 10 or $11 an ounce, but those weren't the real costs, and I think it got the miners in trouble. They weren't honest with the market. They didn't report you know, their, all their costs with all their different line items there saying what the real cost to mine the silver is and what their free cash flow and margins are, and hopefully the miners you know, will, will stop reporting the cash costs completely, 
or if they do, then they'll say, well, this is only to do the mining, and this is not including any of our other expenses to run the business, and this is the real cost of mining, and then the governments will back off after that. Uh, I don't know. It's it's hard to repeal something like that, and I don't know if they would go out of their way to do so. So, you know, we're going to need higher prices soon, or, you know, there will be a lot of companies just going bankrupt up there. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, in the short term, guys, right, the paper price of silver, it could conceivably go quite a bit lower. But it, the one thing I point out, and, you know, people on Wall Street and people that write articles who are not good analysts like you and Chris are, Dave, are they say that, oh, it can go lower and lower and lower, but it's not sustainable. So maybe in the short term it can go lower, but in the long term, you know, unless the government is subsidizing this industry, like what FDR did, right, where they started bailing out the silver miners um, during the deflation after 29, right, um, un unless the government is subsidizing this industry like wind or solar or biofuels, and then they don't have to make a profit, the silver industry has to make a profit at some point, right, to continue. That's right. And that's, you know, 25% of the market is your primary silver producers. And you, know, you got to look at base metal prices as well to see, you know, if there's a possibility of those, you know, in those situations or those cases or they might curtail their mining somewhat or, you know, go back to a um, smaller production rate or whatever. So a lot going on, but I'll just reaffirm what you said, Jason, and that is you cannot – linearly project that it's going to just keep going down because the market has a way of correcting itself because if you can't make money then you're going to have less supply if you have less supply then it gets to a point somewhere in the future where the price starts to come back up because someone's going to pay a bid up higher to get what they need and of course the silver has a luxury in a way of having both industrial demand that doesn't go away and investment demand that uh, can probably only accelerate. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think for people out there, silver stackers, um, you know, obviously they've had their egos and their bank accounts, uh, well, and their, their capital accounts, if they're buying silver for an investment, they've had it hurt a lot. But um, when I buy physical silver, guys, I buy it just for insurance and savings and wealth preservation. When I buy physical metal, I don't buy it really as an investment. When I, buy, when I want investments, I look for mining shares or gold royalty and silver streaming uh, royalty companies. So um, I, I just want to thank you again for your time. Um, please tell listeners where they can find the new book if it's already out and uh, also about the Morgan Report. Okay, the best place to go is start the website, themorganreport.com. Uh, we'll be featuring the book at the uh, Silver Summit on a basis that you can sign up to get it when it's finally published, which is we've got a rough draft ready to go. And uh, so we'll be taking pre-orders. We'll probably set it up on Amazon as well. So that's sort of something we can uh, you can follow, get in on our website. Also, we have a YouTube channel, Silver Guru, which uh, David Smith, our senior analyst, and our analyst, Chris Marchese, are both doing uh, interviews probably on a weekly basis. I still do a couple of interviews a week, and those are almost always for free. Of course, we have private stuff that's on the members-only portion of the website. We try to save our best thinking for our members, but obviously we give a lot of good information to the public at large. And then uh, if you want to see what we read, uh, what we think is really important on almost a daily basis, you can go to our Twitter feed. We're not interested in you knowing how many lattes we have in a day. It's more about what information is out there that's probably critical to the financial markets, not just the metals markets. Yep, and uh, I just want to thank you again for your time, and um, I, I'm interested in reading the book. Uh, I didn't get an advanced copy yet, but uh, maybe you guys can uh, hook it up and send it over, and I'll take a look at it uh, when I have time now. I'm, I'm having gum surgery on Friday, so I'll have some extra free time to, to do some reading. I'll be in bed. So uh, thank you again for your time, guys, and um, congratulations on finishing the book. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do, and um, I'm excited for you guys uh, and to educate our listeners more about silver and gold yeah. and Austrian School Economics. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Right.